Hey there, One Year listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. Is your business reaching an exciting turning point? Are you ready to seize the moment for growth? Well, when you're facing tough decisions, SAP can help you be ready for anything that happens next. To learn more, head to sap.com slash be ready and stick around to hear how the president of an esports league seized the moment. June 12, 1955 was a big day for NBC. The debut of a massive block of programming, one the network hoped might save a dying medium. You are listening to Monitor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Monitor, our new NBC weekend radio service. Monitor was an ultra-long format radio show, 40 hours every weekend, broadcast nationwide. And it sounded different than everything else in the audio universe. The first episode featured a series of dispatches from behind prison walls. Tell me, this is your last night at San Quentin. How does it feel? Pretty nervous and hopeful. Kind of scared. There was also breaking news about an auto racing disaster in France, comedy from Jerry Lewis, and live jazz from Howard Rumsey and his Lighthouse All-Stars. The New York Times called Monitor an electronic grab bag designed to keep a listener guessing. But it was one thing in particular that got America's attention. Her voice is so soft and easy. I can't imagine her ever uh, getting excited about anything, and uh, I could even take a typhoon very calmly when she tells me about it. That soft and easy voice belonged to a woman who wasn't identified by name. She was mysterious and alluring, and she drove everyone absolutely wild. Now the girl who gives out lots of numbers, but withholds probably the most important, her phone number, Miss Monitor. Miss Monitor was the weather reporter. In Atlanta, the temperature is 83, fair, Fargo, 80, partly cloudy, Pittsburgh, 67, rain. According to one historian, in 1955, Miss Monitor probably became the most recognizable female voice in the country. But she wasn't alone. 1955 was the year of the weather girl, the moment when all of a sudden, women weathercasters were everywhere. In every corner of the country, weather girls were enormous stars. They were idolized and lusted over. And in 1955, they were also seen as a major threat. As women transformed radio and television, a group of powerful men hatched a plan. And that plan had the potential to push women weathercasters off the air forever. The big weather story around the nation tonight is a hot one. The whole thing was chaos. It was just a mess. They didn't turn my show off because they never quite knew what to expect. This is one year, 1955. The Weather Girl. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. How do you know when to seize the moment for growth? When your opportunity arrives, you need to be ready. From expanding into new markets to hiring, business leaders face so many tough decisions. My name is Brendan Donahue, president of the NBA 2K League. The NBA 2K League is a professional esport run by the NBA and 2K, where we take 30 million people who play the game of NBA 2K and we find the best 125 in the world to compete in our league. In March of 2020, the start of the pandemic spurred the league to take steps it never imagined. And with SAP tools, they knew they were ready. We could have postponed our season like a lot of other sports leagues did. We decided to seize the moment. We created a competition that could be done virtually. We had the NBA 2K League on major sports networks for 17 weeks. That moment gave us a chance to talk to a mass audience across the world. 
So the majority of our fans, less than 1%, will ever step foot in an NBA arena to watch a game live. But you have this significant fandom and excitement for the game, and so that's really where we think we play a role. Our first season, we had 650,000 people watch our finals in season one. Now our finals this past year, we had 2.2 million people watching. NBA 2K League seized the moment for growth. Will you? Head to sap.com slash be ready to learn more. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle believed that wind was caused by the earth exhaling. So, not one of his better theories. But in his defense, meteorology wasn't an exact science even in modern times. And well into the 20th century, weather forecasters were desperate to shake their bad reputations. Meteorology was kind of a poor stepchild to the basic sciences that underpin it. Bob Hinson is the author of Weather on the Air, a history of broadcast meteorology. It was just a very, very small discipline, a field still struggling for respectability and for clout. The American Meteorological Society was fighting for weather forecasting to get taken seriously. In the years after World War II, its members were building up their scientific knowledge and accuracy. They were starting to understand how the jet stream worked, and they were using radar to visualize storms. And thanks to television, communicating this stuff to the public was about to get a whole lot easier. All right, let's start out west. Dry and warm, mainly, with the exception about from all oh, San Francisco down as far as San Diego along the coast, can be rain coming in. Of course, that'll keep the temperatures down. This is one of the few surviving examples of an early TV weathercast. It's from a show called Camel News Caravan, sponsored by Camel Cigarettes. The weatherman, Clint Yule, had learned meteorology in the Army, but had no training as a broadcaster. His only prop was a black marker, which he used to squiggle on a store-bought map. So these were not necessarily uh, whiz-bang, you know, showbiz-type folks. Uh, but they did convey the, the seriousness of the weather in a serious way. And uh, there will be showers somewhere along the boundary line between these two, roughly along the Ohio River, about this far on Saturday, and maybe spread them over as far as Washington, D.C. by Sunday. North of there, they wanted to ensure there. that when people saw the forecast on TV, that the forecast was being presented as something derived from science, that it wasn't just guesswork. Uh, it wasn't people drawing a forecast out of a fishbowl. This was the American Meteorological Society's vision. Television would bring forecasting out of the shadows and into living rooms. Weathermen could prove their worth by speaking directly to the American people and showing off their charts and graphs. And it was very, very matter-of-fact, I think is the best way to describe it. It was simply saying, here's the forecast. TV executives had another word to describe it. Boring. How do you make the dreary old weather must-see entertainment? It didn't take long for those TV people to come up with an answer. If you couldn't change the forecast, you could replace the forecasters. So that's what they did. In the early 1950s, the scientists were out and entertainers were in. Highest temperature in the nation, 108 degrees at Presidio, Texas. Broadcasters looked for the weather segment to provide a light touch, a bit of comic relief. <coughs> Think of vaudeville, right? You know, uh, there would be one-liners. 44 degrees is what it is at Rexford right now. A fella made up there, made a killing in the stock market. Shot his broker. You know, ba-dum-bum, -bum, ba -dum bum Just all kinds of tomfoolery. New York's best-known weathercaster was a former NBC tour guide named Tex Antoine. And the key to his success was his extremely wooden sidekick. So Tex Antoine had a puppet named Uncle Weatherby, and he had kind of a twirly mustache, and the behavior of this mustache would help denote the weather forecast. A curly mustache meant sunny skies. A droopy one? Rain was on the way. And if Uncle Weatherby got the forecast wrong, he'd show up the next day sporting a black eye. It was a goofy gimmick and an extremely popular one. To stay competitive, the other New York stations needed to do something bold. And so, in 1952, WCBS broke the mold completely. 
It all began with Carol Reed. Greyhound presents Carol Reed with the late weather. Good evening. And if you like cold polar air spilling down out of Hudson's Bay, then maybe it is good news for you, although I think... Carol's kind of trademark catchphrase was, have a happy. And I think it intrigued people because it was open-ended. Uh, you could interpret that however you wanted. So that was a distinguishing feature. But her being a woman was a distinguishing feature. Bit of snow up in, uh, in northern New England. And although uh, it's getting to the end of the ski time, at least we do have some reports for you. Before Carol Reed, no woman had ever been hired to present the weather on TV in a major market. But she was a hit with viewers. And stations in other parts of the country were paying attention, including one in Oklahoma City. It was a novelty, obviously, to have a woman doing the weather. That's Lola Hall. She got her start in 1953. I was the only female in town. I was the only female in the Southwest. There were only three of us in the country. Lola became known as the Channel 9 Weather Girl. Yeah, that's what I was called, and I never objected to it. I thought it was fine. That's what I was. I mean, you know, what else would you have called me? Well, don't tell me that. In the 1950s, she was on the air every morning, starting at 6.55 a.m. I got up early and barely got dressed and drove to the station with my coffee cup. I even had a wreck one time and never spilled a drop of coffee. Lola didn't have a catchphrase, and she definitely didn't have a puppet. Certainly not. <laughs> That's not done here. You know, this, of course, is Tornado Alley. A tornado's destructive power is appalling. Tornadoes can cause buildings literally to explode. So you don't play around doing the weather. It's serious. Although she was not a trained meteorologist, Lola did study the weather. Like other weathercasters, she got her data from the nation's meteorology clearinghouse, the United States Weather Bureau. We didn't have any of those fancy maps and all that sort of thing. Our information came in on, on teletype, in code. You took the numbers and translated them, and you had uh, quite a bit of information to work with. Lola went to the local weather bureau office twice a day to get those numbers and learn how to interpret them. Then it was her job to present the forecast with the cameras rolling. I stood behind a glass map and wrote on it with chalk. And people thought I was writing backwards, but it was a camera trick. You drew the maps as you spoke. You drew in the fronts and explained, you know, the weather patterns, the pressure, the wind, temperatures, and whatever. We don't have any recordings of Lola's weathercasts, but we do know that in the 1950s, it seemed like everyone in Oklahoma City was looking to her for guidance. A dentist called me and his daughter wanted to get married on a certain day and they wanted an outdoor wedding. You know, the forecast was for rain and I said, oh, it'll clear up by afternoon. Well, it did. They thought I was magic. There was one thing about the job that Lola dreaded. Sometimes there was absolutely nothing to say. You know, the weather in Oklahoma in the summertime especially is terrifically boring because it's the same every day. And, um, you know, they would give me a 15-minute weather cast. Can you imagine trying to fill that when nothing changes? It was just awful. But one August day, everything flipped in an instant. The temperature suddenly dropped by a huge amount. Finally, she had something thrilling to report. All she needed was for the anchorman to toss it over to her so she could break the big news about the cold weather. As he finished, he said, be sure and stay tuned for Lola. We've had a cold front come through and the temperatures dropped 30 degrees. And I gave it a pause for the audio man to turn off the mic. And I said, that's right, give it all away, you son of a bitch. But the audio man had not turned off the mic. And it went out, and people dropped their coffee cups all over Oklahoma. The way she remembers it, a group of Baptists tried to persuade the FCC to rescind her station's broadcasting license. 
but Lola's boss stood by her. And about three months later, when things settled down at the FCC and we did keep our license, he called me in and he said, well, he probably is a son of a bitch after all. Lola managed to survive cursing on the air. She also got away with breaking another major taboo. People were not allowed to be pregnant on television, but there I was. I would stand in front of the map and all you could see would be me in California. Lola was a true television pioneer. She was fearless and trustworthy and smart. And by the mid-1950s, she was no longer a novelty. Word spread around the country. Oh, you know, stations are starting to use women. Hey, let's try that here. In a matter of three years, the nation went from having virtually no women doing weather to women doing weather in almost every place you could watch TV. As the television audience exploded nationwide, women weathercasters got their shot in Indianapolis and Washington, D.C. Let's give the weather wheel a spin and see what the weather is going to be for tomorrow. Ready? They were also on in Houston and Pittsburgh. The weather's certainly been pleasant. That is, if you like your weather, hot, humid, and dry. These women were all known as weather girls, and they were expected to perform two different tasks. Announce the next day's forecast and sell products to housewives. Well, I'll be back in just a moment with a look at tomorrow's forecast. But first, Broadloom Carpet Mart can give you wall-to-wall carpeting in your home for only $299. Lola Hall had to read live commercials, too. One of them was for a local dairy. I had to uh, drink sour milk and smile and talk about how lovely it was. Lola could get away with cursing on the air and even being pregnant. But there were some rules that even she couldn't break. Every woman weathercaster had the same look. They were white, fresh-faced, and modestly dressed. And their appearance was always under scrutiny. I remember one lady came by one time and she said, Honey, we just love you. You don't seem to mind wearing the same old dress year after year after year. So I checked my wardrobe after that. It's remarkable how quickly the Weather Girl template got established. Before 1952, there were essentially no women doing the weather on TV. By 1955, they were probably the majority of weathercasters. Life magazine said they were in such high demand because a pretty girl can make almost anything look more interesting. The American Meteorological Society had hoped that television would change how America saw the weather. But nobody had seen this coming. The weather girl was now a full-fledged American phenomenon. But in 1955, something else was happening too. A new prototype was just starting to emerge, one that combined two very different things into a single scintillating package, weather and sex. Sex and weather. I like that description, actually. I mean, weather is somehow such a dry subject, isn't it? I mean, apart from being wet, it's dry. Sex and weather, what's wrong with that? We'll be back in a minute. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you've earned, doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant, doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned to snowboard also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope, Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. Can the living be killed by the dead? 
This is the question Hercule Poirot must answer in A Haunting in Venice, his most terrifying case yet. But in a world of shadows and secrets, who can be trusted? Starring Kenneth Branagh, Jamie Dornan, Tina Fey, Kelly Riley, Michelle Yeoh. Presented by 20th Century Studios. A Haunting in Venice. Directed by Kenneth Branagh. Rated PG-13. Experience the movie event only in theaters Friday. Tickets on sale now. In the early 1950s, weathercasts were sometimes weird and often zany, but it wasn't until 1955 that the weather got sensual. In Atlanta, the temperature is 65, rain, New York City, 74, partly cloudy, Zanesville, 71, clear. The New York Times said that NBC Radio's Miss Monitor made the weather report sound like an irresistible invitation to an unforgettable evening. Another writer called her that voice without any clothes on. Nantucket, 53, partly cloudy. Indianapolis, 77, cloudy. Atlanta, 65. Washington, 43. Bob Henson, the author of Weather on the Air. She simply read the temperatures, so it wasn't a particularly complicated kind of weather cast. And it was a smash, smash hit. Miss Monitor's tantalizing voice got broadcast nationwide every weekend. And her name and figure didn't stay hidden for long. In 1955, a promotional photo was published in newspapers all over the country. In the background is an advertising billboard. It reads, Monitor Weather Bureau. Forecast, sultry and reclining in front of it, wearing a low-cut black gown, is the woman behind the voice, Teddy Thurman. Teddy Thurman was a extremely talented, smart, beautiful woman, grown up in Georgia. She was interested in painting, but segued into doing modeling and uh, ended up on the cover of Vogue magazine. Teddy had flirted with Hollywood. But the only movie she got cast in was the Ed Wood Schlockfest, Jailbait. I don't like dead men cluttering up my place. I want him out of here. You better shut that trap of yours or you'll be joining him. Back in New York, NBC Radio was looking for some fresh talent. And Teddy's southern accent had a certain appeal. She naturally had a low voice, and so she and the producers decided to make it more breathy. San Diego. 72, fair, Asheville, 78, thunderstorms. Not everyone liked Miss Monitor. One woman wrote to her local paper, complaining that Teddy's whispered tones were positively inane. The truth was, Miss Monitor could have been reading the phone book. Her random list of cities and numbers wasn't really forecasting anything. But she was raising temperatures as she reported them. And the archetype she created wouldn't just transform radio. Certainly in television. You know, in many cases it was, oh, let's get a woman, because people like seeing women on the air. But somehow that morphed into, oh, let's get uh, the most beautiful woman we can, or the woman who is a singer, or a dancer, or a model. Miss America 1955, Lee Merriweather did the forecasts on NBC's Today Show. CBS's morning show hired a bathing beauty named Ginger Stanley, who gave her reports from inside a clear aquarium. And on New York's WABC, a former showgirl named Simon McQueen became a weather-casting sensation. I did get a lot of fan mail, actually. Marriage proposals and <laughs> all kinds of things. Simon grew up in England's West Midlands, where the winters are long, cold, and extremely unsexy. She came to the United States in 1956, when she was in her early 20s. Her dream was to make it big on Broadway. I always wanted to be in the theater. Right off, I never had any desire to do any other thing. It didn't take her long to get a break. A meeting with Barbara Walters' father, Lou Walters. He owned a famous New York nightclub, the Latin Quarter. I had to sing for him on stage, and I sang. I've got an island in the Pacific, and everything about it is terrific. 
I've got the moon to... Oh, I've forgotten the lyrics. But anyway, I only knew the one lyric, and he never told me to stop, so I, I did it again, and I did it again. Uh, and then he was laughing hysterically and said, you are not a singer. So he said, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to make you a FEMC. As a FEMC, Simon introduced all the acts at the Latin Quarter, cracking jokes and wearing very skimpy outfits. She was making a name for herself, but the Broadway stage still felt far away. She needed a new stepping stone. She also needed money. Oh, you know, unless you make it big in show business, you're always needing a job. <laughs> and there was a, this really lovely man, and he worked at ABC. And he said to me, you know, they're looking for a weather girl. Mm, do you think you'd like to audition? So I said, sure. Did you have to talk about the weather in your audition? <laughs> well, I was quite honest with him. I said, I'm not terribly interested in weather. I knew nothing about the weather. She didn't know anything about geography either. In her audition, she talked about a storm breaking in the Great Lakes region, near San Francisco. But for the people doing the hiring, her shortcomings didn't seem to matter. I mean, having a cute, sexy young woman was very appealing, and I can quite understand why. Simon got the job. She was WABC's new weathercaster. My show was called Simon Says. I didn't come up with that name. They did. Uh, Simon Says. I came up with my own little catchphrase, which I thought was very cute. And it was, come rain, hail, snow or shine, I'll be with you tomorrow night on time. However, ABC said, eh, eh, no to that. And so that's the story of that. Simon Says was on the air every weeknight at 11.10 p.m. My theme music was Get Me to the Church on Time. And then the show would start. There was a board, this white board, and I had to take a felt tip pen and put the highs and the lows and the ridges. And then I had two sponsors, Snow Crop Orange Juice and Dash Detergent. So, <laughs> so I had to have my cue boards out for that. Simon's Weathercast was pretty much a one-woman operation. She wrote the show, produced it, did her own makeup, and picked out her own wardrobe. I would sometimes wear an evening gown. I would sometimes wear a chic little snappy suit. I, Friday nights, wore sporting clothes because I was going off to ride horses for the weekend. And that was a very popular aspect of my show. I'd give the fashion house a credit if I'd worn their clothes or their jewelry. The weather part of her weather show was less crucial. But Simon did try to learn some meteorology. They did send me down to the Weather Bureau to, uh, to learn the fundamentals of weather forecasting. I appreciated that. I've got a still photograph of me with the head forecaster. I'm looking very intent. But I really had a different show. I didn't talk about the weather in other cities. I just, you know, chatted away about what, what interested me. I talked about myself a lot. I took my basset hound, Joe, on the show. On air, when I was trying to be very serious about my weather report, he would be caught lifting his leg up and peeing in the studio. I mean, all these things happen. I did what I liked. Doing what she liked got Simon loads of attention. The New Yorker profiled her. The New York Times said she was fully sponsored, even when not fully dressed. College men even formed fan clubs in her honor. She was using the weather as a vehicle for stardom, and she wasn't the only one. Teddy Thurman's sultry-voiced Miss Monitor became a major celebrity, too. Copenhagen, very cold. One part of the world is getting warmer and warmer and warmer. Teddy made her name on the radio, but she didn't stay in audio forever. In 1957, she played herself in a movie trailer for a romantic comedy, reading her lines while lying in bed. In Rome, Italy, feminine temperatures will definitely go up on the arrival of that bachelor with 10,000 bedrooms. Teddy also made regular appearances on NBC's Tonight Show, 
camping up her already campy persona. As the cameras focused in, she'd peek out from behind a shower curtain. Then she'd say, I know what you want. You're all the same. You want to know about the weather. Before 1955, the sexy weather girl didn't exist at all as a cultural trope. But just a few years later, it was so omnipresent that it was ripe for parody. Hi, weather lovers. This is actor Jolene Brand in a sketch on The Ernie Kovac Show. 21. 21. 21 in Alaska. And 108 in Georgia. Try to keep cool. Comedians Willard Scott and Ed Walker also did a parody on their radio show, The Joy Boys. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen, Washington's own weather girl, Miss Janitor. Meatloaf, 220. Toll House Cookies, 350. Apple Turnovers, 310. Wait a minute, what are you, what are you doing? I'm giving temperatures of things that you can bake in the oven. <laughs> Although there were still some male weathercasters, the sexy weather girls were getting all the attention. America's leading forecasters had thought television might help them get taken seriously. Instead, TV weather was now a vehicle to sell sex and refrigerators. For the American Meteorological Society, that was a total nightmare. And that's when things really came to a head, when the American Meteorological Society decided basically to launch its first salvo. The meteorologists were fighting back. And they had the weather girls in their sights. Oh, it looks like a bad one. Surprised? Well, a lot of people are going to be caught by this one. Let's take a quick break. What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. I just went to my happy place. I just went to Maui, and it was truly amazing. Priceline has always been about getting you to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else, like up to 60% off select hotels in Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. In July 1955, a meteorology professor published a call to arms in TV Guide. It ran under the headline, Weather is No Laughing Matter. In conclusion, this article said, we heartily approve TV's use of pretty girls, but unless they're qualified, we'd be happier if on TV as on a date, they talk about anything except the weather. Bob Henson says the men of the American Meteorological Society were outraged by what TV weather was becoming. So the AMS appointed a task force. This council of men believed the weather cast could still be saved if they were the ones doing the saving. So they got to work on a new set of rules. One of those was to establish a seal of approval and this was going to be a way to distinguish trained weathercasters from untrained ones. Seals of approval were a big thing in the 1950s. Industry censors gave out seals to movies and comic books that met their standards of decency. The magazine Good Housekeeping also slapped its seal on all kinds of consumer products. Even mixed-up housewives can trust their kitchen gadgets if they carry the Institute seal. To get the AMS seal, weathercasters would have to meet a bunch of criteria. One of them was that they had to enhance the prestige of meteorology. The idea was that weathercasters would apply, they would 
create a essentially an audition reel and demonstrate that they had some knowledge and that their presentations were at least rooted in some science. When the AMS started handing out seals of approval, women made up as many as three quarters of American weathercasters. But the meteorologists' new rules actively excluded women. The AMS said that an interested performer should submit his application. And even to be eligible to apply, a weathercaster needed to have taken coursework in meteorology. The trouble with that was, many male professors refused to accept women in their classes. The seal of approval was certainly open to anyone on its face, but I think it served as a de facto quashing of the weather girl trend. Were there any women who got the AMS seal of approval in the 1950s? No, absolutely not. Were there any women who got the AMS seal of approval in the 1960s? Not a single one. While the AMS had no authority to hire or fire anyone, it did change the conversation inside the television industry about what a weather cast should look like. Maybe perhaps due to this pressure from the American Meteorological Society, they pulled back a little bit on making the sex appeal the center of the weather cast. The TV Guide had a column saying there are still women doing weather on TV, but by and large, uh, they have learned to stick to the facts. By 1959, the sultry, temperature-purring Teddy Thurman had lost her television gig on The Tonight Show. She told a reporter, I guess I was just too sexy for TV. Teddy stayed on the radio a few more years after that, until NBC killed the Miss Monitor segment in 1961. She didn't make the newspapers all that much after her weathercasting heyday, except for a few items about her tumultuous romance with actor and dancer Peggy Fears. Before she died in 2012, she told a reporter that people at parties would still ask her to do the weather in that sexy Miss Monitor voice. I know what you want. Yes, let's get together. I know what you want. You want me to tell you about the weather. The most overtly sexy weathercasters were among the first to leave the airwaves. But it didn't take long for more straight-laced women to start losing their jobs. Unfortunately, a rapid decline in temperatures took place over most of the eastern third of the nation, and uh, we're no exception here in New York. Carol Reed, the first woman weathercaster in a major market, got taken off the air in 1964. The head of her station said he wanted to put the weather in proper perspective and treat it like any other news. I could have had a very good career, I think, in New York, being a weather reporter. But I guess I thought, well, yeah, it's time for me to move on. Simon McQueen did fulfill her dream of making it to Broadway, playing supporting roles in The Odd Couple and in the musical The Boyfriend. I played Dulcie. I had one great number, um, Never Too Late to Fall in Love. I have the record to prove it. You'd love it. And it's never too late to fall in love. Simon is in her 80s and still living in New York. It's now been more than 60 years since she brought sex and weather to the small screen every weeknight at 11.10 p.m. I put uh, all my energy into that show. I did. I was successful at it. And then I went on to other things. And then I went on to times when I didn't have a job because that's uh, the vagaries of show business. What are the roles or the things that you did in your career that you're the most proud of? I don't think I've done it yet. <laughs> I mean, I've done, I've played parts that I think I got very nice reviews for, but I was never the lead. One always wants to be the lead. Are you available for work now? I'm available. <laughs> I'm available, yeah. <laughs> By the early 1970s, the Weather Girl era was over. The AMS had claimed its seal of approval would make TV weather more serious. But mostly, just went back to being male. As women weathercasters dwindled, 
Willard Scott debuted on the Today Show. Northwestern Georgia having some dense fog this morning. We have a little dense fog here in the studio occasionally. Uh, you know, seriously. Are we ever going to get to the weather? Yes, we are. <laughs> Scott was one of the comedians who'd parodied Miss Monitor in the 1950s. When he started doing the weather himself, he didn't take it seriously at all. He actually called himself a buffoon. But nobody yanked him off TV. Instead, he became a cultural institution, clowning his way through national weather broadcasts for decades. In the early days of television, weathercasting was a way for women to get in the door when other pathways were totally closed off. That tiny niche would draw an enormous amount of talent. Gilda Radner, Raquel Welch, and Diane Sawyer all got their starts doing the weather. But the brilliance of those women and hundreds of others was mostly a wasted resource. The American Meteorological Society saw their presence as an insult rather than an opportunity. Today, just 29% of American weathercasters are women, but there are still a handful of pioneers who remember how it used to be. I think it was probably some of the best times in television because it was so open. Lola Hall got her start in TV's Weather Girl era. As her peers got pushed out, she managed to keep on going. I never wanted to leave and go on to a so-called big career someplace else. I never had any ambition for that. Lola didn't have the educational credentials to get a seal of approval. But nobody who watched her really seemed to care. Lola kept on doing the weather and became a legend in Oklahoma City. That's where historian Bob Henson grew up. When I was about seven years old, I was watching My Three Sons. I believe it was a Saturday night. Why can't Robbie dry the dishes? I'll take the trash cans out. I'm taking and right in the middle of this came Lola Hall, the weathercaster, uh, interrupting the show to convey a tornado warning. So I stepped out the front door for just a second and looked up at the sky and saw these roiling clouds illuminated by the city lights, and it just grabbed me. And from that point on, I've been compelled and fascinated by the weather. And it all started with Lola Hall. It absolutely, absolutely did. It was a job. It was a job that I enjoyed a lot. Met a lot of wonderful people, and uh, it was a very enriching kind of a life, really. Lola eventually moved on to education and entertainment reporting. In 1988, she got inducted into the Oklahoma Journalism Hall of Fame for being a pioneer in television as a reporter and a weather girl. Can you give me the weather report for Oklahoma City today? It's dreary. It is chilly. It's cold. It is miserable. You don't want to be here today. Next time on One Year, 1955, Alaska looks to build its first mental health facility, but the plan is derailed by a network of housewives convinced of a communist brainwashing plot. Oh my God, you don't see what's happening here. They're trying to establish a prison camp. This is going to be Siberia, USA. Thanks so much for listening. If you want to hear more of One Year 1955, subscribe to Slate Plus. At the end of the season, Slate Plus subscribers will get a member-exclusive episode with a whole new story and interview. In addition, as a member, you'll also hear every Slate podcast without ads and never hit the paywall on Slate's site. If you'd like to sign up for Slate Plus, go to slate.com slash one year plus. Again, that's slate.com slash one year plus. This episode was written by me, Josh Levine, One Year's editorial director. Our senior producer is Evan Chung. One Year is produced by Kelly Jones and Evan Chung, with additional production by Sophie Summergrad. It's edited by Joel Meyer and Derek John, Slate's executive producer of narrative podcasts. Our senior technical director is Merritt Jacob. Holly Allen created the artwork for this season. Bob Hinson is the author of Weather on the Air, a history of broadcast meteorology. Carol Reed's Weathercast came from Phil Grice and Archival Television Audio Incorporated. 
episodes of NBC's Monitor came from Dennis Hart, author of Monitor Take Two, the revised, expanded, inside story of Network Radio's greatest program. We had research support from the Oklahoma Historical Society. You can send us feedback and ideas and memories from 1955 at oneyearatslate.com. You can call us on the One Year Hotline at 203-343-0777. We'd love to hear from you. Special thanks to Paul Gad, Carol E. Diggs, Jim Minnick, Dan Epstein, June Thomas, Christina Cotarucci, Madeline Ducharme, Susan Matthews, Katie Rayford, Ben Richmond, Caitlin Schneider, Cleo Levin, Seth Brown, Rachel Strom, and Alicia Montgomery, Slate's VP of Audio. We'll be back next week with more from 1955. We chase tornadoes. That's what we do down here. I saw one come through my backyard, and I stood in front of that plate glass window because it was fascinating. The colors and all were just fascinating. And then I thought, you dumb shit. This is ridiculous. And so I backed off to a safer location in the house. You know, I'm, I'm not easily scared, I guess.